Welcome to this Interpave webinar. We'll be exploring how straightforward flow controls can make the most of concrete block permeable paving for sustainable drainage systems, better known as SUDS. Our presenter is Bob Bray, a landscape architect and director of Robert Bray Associates, a man with a passion for how rainfall can contribute to the well-being of people, wildlife and the environment. Much of Bob's working life has been dedicated to SUDS as was recently recognised with the 2020 Syria Lifetime Achievement Award. Hello everyone, it's Bob Bray here. I hope you'll enjoy this short talk. It's about using flow controls, both for permeable pavement, but also for suds in general, and giving you an idea as to why we should use these controls and how they can benefit the design of suds in so many ways. Managing rainfall naturally uh, requires water to be held back within the landscape to mimic what happens in nature. SUDS uses this idea by controlling the flow in every part of development and releasing it slowly as a controlled flow of clean water. This presentation describes how this can be achieved through design and small orifice controls. I'm going to look at three schemes in detail later on. One is an urban regeneration scheme, Bridges Joyce Square in London. And this is important because it integrates SUDS completely into a redevelopment scheme. The second one is a new civic de development, a redevelopment really, of a Bromsgrove School, a high school, which was redundant and became part of new civic centre, and how the spaces around it and the new buildings have been managed using flow controls to assist in infiltration. And an older scheme uh, by far is Spring Hill housing, co-housing. And this demonstrates some of the evolution of, of these ideas. I've been looking at SUDS now since 1996, and I hope I've been able to <laughs> innovate as new ideas and new ways of thinking have, have come about. Let us look at the beginning at the nature of SUDS. It's really important that we understand why we're doing this and the characteristics of SUDS in as much that they try to mimic what happens in nature. You'll see here on the left-hand side a natural basin. It's in Pembrokeshire. And probably this has happened just after rainfall, when a natural depression in the ground is filled with water. And a great deal of it is either soaking into the ground or evaporating or being lost through the leaves of trees and other plants. And in a way, this encapsulates how suds can work. It's not just about collecting water as quickly as possible and getting rid of it as quickly as possible. It's about collecting it, letting natural losses to occur, and then releasing that water that remains, releasing that in a, in a controlled way. And on the right-hand side is a basin, it's at Bridget Joy Square, where these ideas are in place. And just looking in the foreground, if you would, for a moment, you can see there's a box with uh, stone fill in it. And I'll come to that when we talk about flow controls in detail. But the important thing to know there is that water, as it fills this basin, firstly has to wet the ground. It has then to soak into the ground, and some will soak further into the ground, if you like, over a long period of time. It's on a clay base, so if it keeps raining, water will accumulate at the surface. Now that box of stone, within that box of stone, is what we call a protected orifice. That is, it's an orifice that doesn't have to deal with the normal pressures of an opening in a flow control. The flow controls we use in SUDS are very small. They go down to 20, 15 millimetres. And the important thing is to stop blockage. And we do this by protecting the orifice. In this case, through a stainless steel gabion box, the water has to pass through stone and then through a filter before it gets to the orifice and then goes down a pipe. And in this case, it goes to a combined sewer because that's the only place it can go. You will see also a little grating to the right-hand side. When a certain level is reached in this structure, there is an overflow. So most of the time, most of the time, there is very little water leaving this, this basin. This is a, a natural basin in as much that it's made of soil planting. And wherever possible, we try to replicate that scenario because that's what would happen in nature. Now, we also use these flow controls in permeable pavement because permeable pavement in many ways replicates this basin. Water can leave it 
through the surface, water can evaporate from the surface, it can evaporate from the stone below the surface, and some water can be lost into the ground. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So to sum up that natural way of managing rainfall, we have those natural losses. That's evapotranspiration and water going into the ground and, and wetting the, the ground that exists. These losses, the first amount of these losses, we call interception losses, because they happen before, if you like, there's any runoff or any infiltration at all. And these interception losses can be really very significant in, in summer. They can be 20, 30, 40% of the rainfall event and that sort of depth as well. We are generally, as a rule of thumb now, using five millimetres as a, a, a good average for what we can lose through that first interception losses. But what that means is we have to replicate those natural situations. We can't get them from hard paving and we can't get them from tank storage. We then find that some water will then begin to go into the ground. These are sometimes called long-term losses or long-term storage. And then we either have an infiltrating site or we have a site that generates runoff. And very simply, if you look at the hydrograph to the right, you'll see that a normal post-development without any flow controls in the blue, that's the sort of response you get. If you put an ordinary flow control in a development without any suds, you will get the red line. That is, there will still be more water taken out of the site than would naturally happen. What we're aiming for is the green line. And the green line, the pre-development line, if we provide suds in the right way, we should mimic that hydrograph. Now, concrete block permeable pavement is one of those innovations which has allowed us to design suds in very urban contexts. This uh, arrangement is very much like some of the landscapes, stone landscapes you find in the country. I live in the Cotswolds. And there we've got oolitic limestone where water comes through the surface, perhaps only a soil layer of 50 to 100 millimetres, and then through broken stone into oolitic limestone below and full infiltration. And concrete block paving mimics that in many respects. So the first thing it does, it collects the water, and it collects the water at the surface and through the surface. Sometimes people are a bit surprised that uh, these surfaces can be so effective. We've been using them since, uh, uh, I think the first one we used was in 1996-1997. And the pavements we put in in 2004-05, we know, have performed wonderfully, in my opinion, <laughs> given the concerns originally expressed. They manage all of that water and it takes a very long time for them to, to block given normal maintenance and the fact that nobody drops, uh, say, a load of topsoil on the surface. If you want to know more about that, I suggest you look at an interpave document or the report that described the work done at the Flows Project, which is sometimes called Lamb Drove in uh, Camborne in Cambridgeshire. And there, a surface which hasn't been looked after particularly well is still providing full control, management, cleaning and discharge of rainwater. So we get cleaning and storage as part of this profile. However, if we can't infiltrate all of this water completely, we get a situation where, in number the second one down here, where there's no infiltration, and that's a very unusual arrangement, but sometimes we have to line systems for other reasons, either if we're on a slope or if there are pollution risks or whatever. But very often we have something like a partial infiltration, which is the bottom one, where some water goes into the ground, even on clays, but some is collected and taken through to a flow control. So I often talk about the image of a bath and a, a bath with a plug hole. And the plug hole is the flow control. And the bath is, if you like, depending on the depth of it, a water will go out quickly or it'll go out relatively slowly, depending on the depth, the head of water behind that hole. Now, why should we use flow controls at all? Well, not only are we thinking of that single bath, we're thinking also of a number of baths linked together. And this idea evolved, I suppose, with the realisation that to get the maximum benefit from suds, you need to break up the collection into a number of subcatchments. The subcatchment design means that you can collect locally all of the water that falls on that local area. It means that you can manage that pollution much more effectively because you don't have mixing of different areas with different pollution loads. But it also means that you can make use of any suds feature you have. 
So the little diagram on the left shows that in principle, there's three circles which, if you have no flow control on those three circles, they could be permeable pavement, they could be a basin or whatever, then you need a large structure at the end of the system. There are a lot of other disadvantages to that as well. In passing, we'll talk about the risk of pollution, land take, and the difficulty in managing those flows. But if we go down to the bottom left, you can see that if we put a flow control on the end of each of those subcatchments, we can use those subcatchment structures, and there some of them are on the right-hand side here, the permeable pavement, the basin, the rain garden, at the green roof. All of these SUDS features can have a flow control, which means that the final storage feature is much reduced in size, and the water that's flowing towards it is clean, because it's been cleaned in the SUDS feature. So this gives us the added benefit of, of having a control flow of clean water that we can use either for amenity or biodiversity within development as well as outside development. So that the idea of the subcatchment is really, really important in SUDS. But the only way that we can achieve that is to put flow controls within development to define those subcatchments and to get all the benefits from them. So how do we do that? Well, I can only tell you how we do it, and we had to develop a series of flow controls which met our requirements. So they're, they're called contro flows. If you are interested in them, you could go to a website, which is www.sudstore.com. Now, the point about this is these are small because we need quite a lot of them. They're shallow because that's how sud structure should be, and they require the protected orifice. Now, permeable pavement is ideal in this situation because the pavement itself, the water passing through the pavement, through the open graded stone, becomes clean and carries very little silts with it before it gets to the flow control. And any silt that does get through this system is smaller than the flow control orifice. So whether you're using intermediate ones, similar to the 315 diameter chambers that we sometimes use, or the more normal universal chamber with an overflow, so that if that storage feature surcharges, the water can overflow into the next part of the system. They're all shallow. They all require protection to the orifice. So therefore, they all need something in front of them to allow this slow flow to pass through. And because the flow is slow, most of the debris falls out if it's heavier than water anyway in the suds feature. If it's lighter than water, then it will float. And all of these potential blockage structures and larger grits and silts are therefore trapped within the suds feature themselves. And we haven't had any of these block. And it's important to know that although there are more of these suds control structures in most sud schemes, they are more shallow, they're simpler, and they allow a lot of cost saving by reducing the need for bigger volumes further down the system. This... Uh, <laughs> Interesting little graphic here shows you how the thing works. The water comes into the permeable pavement and you can see that it can fill up at whatever rate independently of the, the orifice. It can be a high intense rainfall event. It can be a long duration rainfall event. But the storage structure, i.e. the pavement, stores that water and allows it to go through the protected orifice slowly. And that might take anything up to six or eight hours. And you can see that if that was surcharging, the water will run over the top. So the design of the structure beforehand is based on whatever return period we decide is appropriate for that structure. And there can be further structures down the system with their own flow controls to manage any additional volumes. So let's have a look at Bridget Joyce Square. This is in London and in an area which one might describe as not having all the advantages that London might offer. It had social problems, but it also had opportunities. And one of the opportunities was to redevelop a road surface and the adjacent space to it in a form of urban improvement. Now, the initial genesis of this was to demonstrate permeable pavement on a road surface. So you can see in the centre slide here that we've got permeable block paving, but it's integrated into the redesign and the redevelopment of this urban space. Equally, there are other features. So on your left-hand side here is a rain garden. Now, a rain garden is very useful for collecting things like roof water. To add bioretention, bioretention gives you a further cleaning mechanism. So we have a rain garden on the left-hand side with a very expensive gutter. 
and uh, rather interesting downpipe. That cleans roof water and you can see there's a flow control on the side there. In the centre picture you've got straightforward permeable pavement. That water could either go through a flow control or in these situations here water can flow into a rain garden, a bioretention rain garden because the water has to go through a cleaning mechanism before it flows out. This shows an innovation in this scheme that because there was concrete construction underneath this pavement, the permeable block pavement is laid on a grit layer and the storage is within the rain garden. But that's a, if you like, unusual, although it has tremendous opportunities for the future, we think. So there's a plan of the extent of the, the project. You can see the thick blue arrows represent the flow of water into the rain gardens. So the ones which come from the roof, the roofs are essentially clean water. In this case, there is relatively low risk of pollution. So the water that comes from the permeable surfaces has been pre-cleaned to a degree with all dust, all grit, all tyre waste and probably most oils will have been collected and treated within the grit layer before that water flows into the open gardens. And this is an important use of permeable pavement here is that Although in itself it doesn't give you an amenity benefit directly, it's very, very important in allowing you to have good quality green space and good quality water to use in the environment, in this case, to have really attractive rain gardens which are not receiving any large levels of pollution. And there's the scheme all in all. You can see there's a rain garden picking up roof water from the left-hand side, a very <laughs> a very dramatic way of, of managing water for rain garden but this just shows the sort of interesting ways you can manage this rainfall and in the centre is a more conventional rain garden as much as the water comes off either car park in the left hand side directly through some letterboxes into the basin or from the permeable pavement which surrounds it. The second example of what we're dealing with here is uh, a development at Bromsgrove. This was a school very much like the grammar school I went to but rather grander, shall we say. It's just a great two-listed building. But surrounding it are a number of buildings which have been added on, but also some new buildings, to create this courtyard. Now this courtyard is within an area that will take infiltration as long as there's enough time for that water to infiltrate. So it's important that the water is held back so that there is enough time for that water to go all of that water right up to the one in a hundred year return period storm for that all to soak into the ground and that takes time and therefore the features here all of the hard features are permeable so that's the permeable block paving in your foreground the block slab paving which surrounds the little rill the green space is permeable and you'll notice that it's slightly lower than the surrounding permeable pavement so all of these surfaces are permeable if there should be a very big rainfall event and the water can't infiltrate as it falls, in worst case scenario, this centre will fill and form a basin. And the reason the water can't escape is because there is a flow control at the outfall. Now, it's a relatively level site and therefore the whole part of this development constitutes an infiltration basin. But because it's been integrated into this design, the whole basin is multifunctional. So it's, it's used for all the things that a civic centre might do, weddings, funerals, births, and just paying your rent. All of this is a space for every other activity, and it also functions as a subspace. The little bit of water that comes off the roof, we have to collect that, and you can see that comes out through a spout in the wall. That is an attractive feature in itself, we hope. It goes into that little rill, and that rill it can infiltrate, but it can also overflow into the subbase below. There is another part of this site, and that's the car parking. And what's really interesting here is that because there was contamination of the subsoil, even though it was good infiltration ground, we had to line the system to prevent contamination of the ground. And the way this was done was to use ordinary blacktop as the surface so the cars could come off a tarmac road onto a little tarmac apron and then each of the parking spaces was in permeable block paving. And you can see the little red dot. Each little red dot represents a flow control. So you've got one, two, three, four, if you like, baths <laughs> in sequence with a plug hole of a different size to let that water out of each of those storage structures uh, go right down to the, the corner of the site 
and then it can travel quite a long distance to the final outfall, which is right at the bottom of the side. Once it's past that car park area, we no longer need to line it. And so there is a swale feature, which you can see marked in red. The swale is just to the right of that. So there is a degree of infiltration. And most of the time, most rainfall events, there is sufficient space and area for that water to naturally infiltrate. But there is an overflow, and the overflow will go to the sewer, as it would do anyway now. But the water that goes to the sewer will be clean and it will be flowing relatively gently. But most of the time, this water will infiltrate into the ground. So you can see the square in the centre there in the centre of the building complex and the car parking which serves it at about 11 o'clock on the drawing. The final example is one which was done quite some time ago, 2004-ish, something like that. And here again, a sequence of spaces, a sequence of techniques and where the car parking is, and this is an unusual housing development because the central pedestrian street, as you can see in the centre of the sequence here, the centre photograph, does not have cars on it. The area that has cars on it is up at the top of the site, and you can see that on the left, and that has a mixture of impermeable blacktop and permeable concrete block paving. Now, we seldom use underground storage structures like tanks or concrete pipes, but in some situations, they are necessary, but they have to be used with care. And our view on this one is that the large amount of water which potentially can reach this permeable pavement, the storage required is much larger than the depth of the sub-base. The sub-base is a third by volume storage, and we needed much more than that. And so the water that gets into this permeable pavement, some of it is stored within boxes underneath that permeable pavement, and the water enters them through a two mil mesh protective fabric around each group of boxes. And what that means is that the risk of silt getting into those boxes is very much reduced. And also that water is clean when it gets into the box so that the box can release its water as a controlled flow of clean water in just the same way as any other such structure. So it has this the permeable pavement in conjunction with the box is, is a great way of storing large volumes of water. That water at the top of the site goes through a flow control and so the car park water comes out very slowly. Some of the roof water doesn't take that route and comes out much more quickly and drops down a cascade down into the bottom. And it finally reaches this little pond at the right hand side. Everything that gets into that pond is relatively clean and the pond has polishing effect to some degree. It also has a storage effect, so there's 300 millimetres of storage, or 300 millimetres thereabouts, and it has a flow control on the end of it, and an overflow, which you can just see, I think, uh, breaking the top of the wall. Underneath the centre street, there are, again, some boxes, but they only provide a very small element of the storage. The one-in-one, one-in-two-year storm, everyday rainfall, which goes into those boxes. And you can just see through the fence in the centre photograph, most of the time, a green space which doesn't have water in it, but for anything above the one in two year return period storm, that's where water can go. What is interesting here is in all the time it's been here, there have been some very big rainfall events. And because it's such a leaky system, that basin has only filled to more than about 300 millimetres on one occasion. It's designed for the one in 25 year return period storm, but it's only filled two or three times, I think, up to the 300 mark. Most of the time, water soaks into the ground or it takes such a long time to travel through the site that by the time it's got to the end, the high peak rainfall event has stopped. So it's been a good learning experience, this, this scheme. And it does show that by using these permeable surfaces and using flow controls to reduce the rate that water travels through the site, the site is very much more resilient and loses water all the way down through the management train. And here's the plan of it. You can see the car parking at the top. That's where the permeable pavement is. You can see the blue boxes underneath that permeable pavement. The water in the pedestrian street below enters via a planted rill, which hopefully takes out most of that pollution. And uh, this is a very early scheme with small silt traps. And it has taught us not to use small silt traps, not because possibly they don't work, although we're not sure that they work very effectively, but it requires a level of maintenance that seems to be very difficult to achieve on a, on a day to day basis. So all of our schemes now don't have those sorts of structures. We assume all the maintenance, with the exception of looking in these control structures, is based on looking at the surface, what you need to do at the surface. And it's only the flow control structures that need any sort of checking.
So just to finish, here's uh, an evening shot of Bridget Joyce Square. And as I say, this has shown tiny flows of water coming off this. And there are a goodly number of flow controls here. There's flow controls on the permeable pavement. There's flow controls on each of the rain gardens and the bioretention structures in the centre. And we're down to very small orifices and very small rates of flow from this site. So just to conclude, if you need to know any more about the use of permeable pavement and sites, please go to the interpave documents as you see here. But remember that to make them work really effectively, you do need these flow controls throughout a development. And our experience is that they should be small and shallow, easily accessible, easily understood when somebody takes the lid off as to how they work. And therefore, you get maximum benefit and you get this nice controlled flow of clean water coming off where you could potentially have <laughs> dirty water rushing off at who knows what rate. So I do hope that's been helpful. Thank you very much for listening. That concludes this Interpave webinar. But if you do have any questions, please email them to info at paving.org.uk. You can also find out more about concrete block permeable paving via the Interpave web resource www.paving.org.uk, including detailed design construction and maintenance guidance, case studies, and introductory information on all aspects of permeable paving for SUDS.